vulnerable. How the narcissist exploits your vulnerabilities. Do you remember those early heady days when I first began to seduce you? Of course you do. Those moments have been branded into your memory and can never be erased, no matter how hard you try. And so wonderful were those initial months of our courtship, as we began our dance together, that you cannot help but recall them and feel that bittersweet tinge. Many times, as you have fought through your devaluation and disengagement, you have harked back to those magical moments as you sought some kind of solace from them. Somehow, as you are sat with tear-stained cheeks, you would force a smile through the misery as you latched on to remembering the things that I said to you, those beautiful, loving, and mesmerizing words which gripped your heart and took it heavenward. It was impossible to resist the love bombing which I released upon you, and similarly it is impossible for you to banish those memories as you sit amongst the debris of our relationship, wondering what on earth has happened. You can easily be forgiven for seeking refuge from the misery amongst those golden thoughts. It is the obvious thing to do, to try and take away the searing pain which now burns you. Naturally, this is all something which was planned, and is a natural consequence of being entangled with one such as I, where I am aware. For those of my kind who are not aware, the actions were caused instinctively, as part of the necessity of the assertion of control and the drawing of fuel. You ought not to feel any shame in the fact that you keep running to those thoughts and taking hold of them as you seek to ease your agony. Keep doing it. All the others did, and all the others will. If you keep going to those thoughts, you remain connected to me. You keep your emotional thinking high. It makes it harder for you to move on, and makes you vulnerable to me for when the hoovers come. You remain tenderized. As you walk through those wonderful thoughts and memories, replaying our time together like an incessant loop of our best-of moments, do you recall what else you did during this seduction? Can you remember something else that was happening as we created these scintillating memories? Yes, I know you can remember. How could you forget? It was one of the many things that I did for you which drew you closer to me and made you fall oh so deeply in love with the illusion. What was it that I did? I made you feel safe. I created that sanctuary and opened the door and ushered you in. I showed you how this gleaming and beautiful paradise was impregnable to the wretched and woeful world beyond. I assured you that being in here with me meant that you need never worry about those things again. I would keep the wailing tormentors from your door and ensure that those things troubled you no longer. That was the sole condition for entry into this haven that I had constructed for you. Tell me about those things which have hurt you. Tell me about the things which haunt you. Tell me about the things that trouble you, so that I can better shield you from them. You had never had someone make such a sacrifice for you before. The way that I understood how badly those things had affected you. A combination of my intellect and the fact that I have done this so many times before enables me to understand. There is no emotional empathy. I simply do not care. But what I do do is understand, for in understanding what you are, how you feel, what you say and how you behave makes me all the more effective. I see you all as part of an experiment. Each one that has come my way, I have encouraged you to open up your hearts, to raise your neck to the world, to enable me to see beneath the bonnet, to enable you to expose your frailties, your vulnerabilities, and thus grant me a fascinating albeit contemptuous view of what makes you tick, or at least part of what makes you tick.
The unaware of our kind elicit this information nevertheless, the narcissism storing it, to use it. The aware of us not only recognize why we are obtaining this information, but we take a curious fascination in just how it works. It's as if we seem to grasp the impact that those things had upon you as we listened with feigned patience and comprehension. You were hesitant at first, the mere act of recollection being one that caused you consternation. You had no issue in confiding in us, no, that was not the issue. We had banished any concerns that you may have had about trusting us with these secrets, and within moments we did so, such was our assured charm. No, what troubled you was bringing those dark memories, those tragic foibles, to the surface once again. Yet as the words came from your mouth and the tears trickled down your cheeks, you felt the cathartic effect of offloading all of those things to us. From the minor concerns through the deep-seated and life-changing troubles, you conveyed each and every one to us, and you will admit that it felt wonderful to do so. The burden came away from you, and for the first time ever, you perhaps felt freedom from those things as you passed the baton on to us. And, of course, purely for the purposes of our own needs, we readily took that baton from you. You exercised those ghosts and stepped into our sanctuary, elated and delighted to have been able to purge those things from you and embrace a new start with us. For too long, those things had held you back. For too long... You had walked a rocky road alone, stooped and bent double under the weight of your concerns. There had been others, but you did not feel able to share the load as you did with me. I was different. There was something about me which made you feel like you could tell me anything and everything, and I would be able to deal with it. I would flex those angelic wings and extend them to surround and protect you. Unburdened by those things, you walked taller, felt stronger, and you had me to thank for this process. Your gratitude and admiration flowed incessantly, and I, of course, was only too happy to wash myself in this fountain of praise, although in keeping with the persona I had created, I accepted your compliments with a humble acknowledgement. You accented my sanctuary, and you told me all of your weaknesses. This was achieved in a way that you felt no shame in telling me of them. That was another difference. You knew that I would not judge you for them. You believed that was the case. However, you were being judged. My contempt for your frailty and your weakness was just masked. I know how to keep that hidden. It had taken time. But, as if smelling a foul odour, I no longer wrinkle my nose at your weakness. Not in instances such as this. I managed to mask my contempt. I managed to keep my utter dismay at how weak you are from being represented upon my face to you. Accordingly, giving the appearance of not judging you, you then believed that I would not regard you as silly or stupid for having certain concerns. It is how you regard them that matters, not how everyone else views them. You remember that sentence, and how you seized it with great gladness, thankful that at last somebody understood and recognised how to deal with your concerns. Your confidence in me was absolute, and I even made it seem as if I actually liked your weaknesses, and that gave you great comfort. All that I was doing... As you sat there on those many occasions where you shared your concerns, your vulnerabilities and weaknesses with me, for they did not all come out in one session, no, it took weeks of careful extraction on many different occasions to amass them. All that I was doing was stockpiling my armoury. For me, I do so in an aware manner like those who are similarly aware of my kind. But this is also done by the unaware kind, perhaps not with the same forensic ability or with such accuracy, but they do so nevertheless. The very fact, for instance, that your admission that you cannot swim and thus are terrified of deep water was met with a sympathetic sound and a nod of the head, whilst behind the scenes 
it was being moulded into a missile to be fired against you at a later juncture. Your explanation that you were bullied at school because you had short hair arising from having to have it shorn because your brother poured glue over your head one time became a hand grenade. The fact that you suffer a noticeable red flush across your chest and neck when you feel agitated created a bullet. Your confession that you suffer excessive wind formed another bullet. The abuse you suffered at the hands of a family member when you were eight became a thermonuclear device ready to be detonated at a later date. Each and every weakness, from your inability to resist eating a packet of biscuits in one sitting, through to your fear of public speaking, was noted, recorded and fashioned into a weapon. Understand that this is done consciously by the narcissist that is aware and is done unconsciously by the unaware narcissist. Those of us that are aware know why we are extracting this information. We create the facade of compassion whilst making a note to use this information at the appropriate time, should the need arise. For the unaware narcissist, the information is gathered as part of an honest belief in feeling sorry for you, in being supportive. But that information is all being put into a chest, ready, should the need arise at a later juncture, for the narcissism to reach into that chest and pick out your vulnerability about the abuse that you suffered and then to fire it back at you. With the unaware narcissist, there is no deliberate intention to gather that information to use it against you. On the contrary, the unaware narcissist believes that they are being kind and they have no desire to use it against you, nor even the conscious awareness of putting it to one side just in case. They do not do that. This information is purely gathered on the surface as part of being supportive. But what the narcissism does is it files it away, and should the need arise, it will be used. But the unaware narcissist is not told that this is what is going on. Each weakness that is admitted you thought that you were handing to the listener for us to carry on your behalf. The reality was that you were giving us the material from which we could create a weapon, be it a sharp stick with which to prod you, or a nuclear missile to obliterate you. You thought that it was some form of absolution, but all you were doing was arming us. We always want to know about your weaknesses, either consciously or unconsciously, in an aware manner or are unaware. The unaware narcissists do so with the facade of compassion and helpfulness, truly believing it. But the greater and the ultra, this is done consciously, that we are pretending to care, and that we are storing this information should the need arise. And perhaps we would expect that we should not, for as we recruit you, we want you to succeed. We want you to ensure that you do not foul foul of us. But should you do so, well, it's always sensible to have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, and a plan E. Your weaknesses become forged into our strengths in readiness for any war of devaluation that may have to be waged against you. To that end, we want your vulnerabilities for we will exploit them, whatever they are, at a later juncture, should the need arise, whether it is consciously in the state of the greater or the ultra, or unconsciously, where lesser or mid-range. Keep talking. There is an arsenal which needs to be created.